Hallelujah. Let me see if I got any. Huh. Hurry up. <laughs> Goodness sakes. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. How many has got your Bibles tonight? Amen. We are, I, I debated whether, I started working on a message and it was for Sunday, and then all of a sudden it was Wednesday. That thing creeped up right on me. So I'm back to working on Sunday again. Praise God. But I wanted to, um, I had a feeling that it would be good to address a topic of the true meaning. Everybody say the true meaning of Christmas. The true meaning of Christmas. And uh, we are in that season. We are approaching that time. And by the time Christmas gets around to us, we will have forgotten this message. And have been overwhelmed with the cultural meaning. But uh, we'll do our best to lay a bit of a, a, a subject for us to consider. Let's stand and let's turn our, to our Bibles to the book of Luke. Chapter 2, everybody say hallelujah. I don't, I don't know about you, but that weekend was incredible. It was fabulous and has, has been stated to me personally and uh, through our social media that it probably, well, I mean, of course, I'm saying it, I don't want to sound like it's because of, because of the content of it, but it, was, it certainly felt like it was probably one of the most spiritual events that uh, I have ever been a part of. Um, supernatural, I think, is what the word my wife used, uh, supernatural events in this church. And I appreciate all of your um, participation, and I appreciate... Uh, I just appreciate you being here and supporting that. And um, the Lord is just good to us. Amen. And we want to continue that, that feeling that God gave us. So Luke chapter 2, uh, the scripture reads, And it came to pass in verse number 1 in those days that there went forth, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this tax thing was first made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria. And when all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. This setting, which is spoken of in several of the Gospels, this setting is what we refer to as the first Christmas. But we must dive in a little bit more deep into the workings of our Heavenly Father to really find what the true meaning of Christmas is. I wonder if we could put our Bibles down and let's lift our hands and ask God to touch us tonight and open up our understanding to Him and embrace His Word. We love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for your spirit that is rich and present. We thank you, Lord God, for your wonder-working power. We ask God, as your word goes forth, that it would change us, that it would help us, that it would deliver us. We ask this in your precious holy name. And everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, the common concepts surrounding uh, Christmas is when, when, when we talk about the true meaning of Christmas and when it's discussed, 
We typically, and we understand biblically, that Christmas is, is really not about giving, it is about the birth of our Savior. And that is correct to some degree, but may not be the true meaning of Christmas. Christmas as an event or the birth of the Savior is and, and, and should be understood to be far more than just a baby being born of a virgin a baby being laid down in a manger, a baby that is heralded by angels and visited by shepherds and wise men. And I want to just unpack a little bit tonight because I believe there's a far deeper meaning to all of those pieces of this great event that we need to remember. We have to remember that to truly... Uh, probably to fully understand the true meaning of Christmas, we've got to first go back to the true beginning of Christmas. Christmas, biblically, really began a long time before Bethlehem's manger or the wise men's gift. It started a long time before Joseph fell in love with with Mary. Christmas, from its roots, I believe, can be found having its beginnings in the Garden of Eden. And it's here we find that there is a world of absolute perfection. Even, even humanity tending the garden and having dominion were absolutely perfect. Turn to your name and say they were perfect. If you're married, turn to your spouse and say, just like you. Perfect. But we know that there was one single act of disobedience that changed the entire landscape of perfection. All of it changed. Everything that was intended Everything that was set up was no longer because of one act of disobedience. I think we could all agree and say amen that when there is an act of disobedience, however small or however great, it changes everything. And somebody say amen if you're a parent. If you were parented, say amen. It changes everything. I think we could trace the true origin of Christmas back to Genesis chapter 3. Starting in verse number 1, the, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may, eat of the tree of the, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And woman, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Believe it or not, I think that Christmas began to arise when man began to fall. This is the beginning of this event that we are about to embark upon. How is this possible? This event is traditionally focused around one moment. It's focused around this birth 
of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and yes, of course, we are approaching this season, this moment that we should consider and recognize that our Lord and Savior, Jesus, was born and God robed himself in flesh and dwelt among us and gave us an opportunity. But we have to remember that there was perfection and then there was not perfection. And we have to consider what happened as a result of man's sin. In Genesis chapter 3, continuing on, in verse 14, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Everybody say, her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in thy conception, and sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and they desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of the, thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And verse number 15 is the verse that we want to focus on in this chapter. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. We have to understand a very, very fundamental biblical doctrine that it was because of the fall of man back in Genesis that God promised redemption. And redemption could only come through the shedding of blood. Remember, in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, the Bible says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. We recognize that the blood of bulls and goats, however, could not do the job that was necessary. All that those sacrifices did in the Old Testament, the Bible tells us that would roll the sins forward yet another year. Hebrews 10 and 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. And what animal blood could not do in the Old Testament. The precious blood of Jesus Christ did do in the New Testament. Can somebody say amen to that? First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 tells us, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood, blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So while the true meaning of Christmas is not gifts, it's not gluttony, it's not gratification, neither is it simply the birth of a baby in Bethlehem, the true meaning of Christmas is God's desire and ability to turn tragedy into triumph. That is the true meaning of Christmas, is that he took and he has the ability to take tragedy in our life and turn it around into triumph for the entire world. Can somebody say amen? amen. The tragedy of our sin has been changed into triumph over sin. Why? Because of the birth of the Christ child in that manger. What we are about to 
embark upon in celebration is not the beginning of a new thing. It is the culmination of something that had already been put into place from the time of the garden. It was something that God foresaw down the road. And he said, there's going to be a day, there's going to be a moment when I'm going to come on the scene and the woman that started the fall from her is going to be the answer to the fall. It's going to be the answer that's going to give every man and woman the ability to come back into the perfection of relationship with me. Can somebody say amen? The woman was the perpetuator of the evil, but God used the woman to defeat the evil one by birthing uh, that man-child, Jesus Christ. Remember, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It's going to bruise your head and you're going to bruise his heel. You're going to have some victory at Calvary, but at the end of the day, your head is going to be crushed. This is the true message of Christmas, that God is able to turn tragedy into triumph. It doesn't matter how bad you've blown it. It doesn't matter how far a person has gone. Christmas is to remind us uh, that it does not matter how far that God in his wisdom can turn the worst into the best, can turn the lowest into the highest, can turn the furthest into the closest. It doesn't matter how bad a person has blown it, how many times uh, they give up, uh, God can turn it into a victory and he started that process uh, by being born of a virgin uh, and making himself available to the cross uh, that we might be able to enter in to that door. Christmas uh, is about victory. Christmas uh, is about making it to heaven. Christmas uh, is about hope. Uh, Christmas is about turning the corner from bad to good. Uh, I'm thankful that I can celebrate uh, the opportunity uh, that once I was lost uh, and now I'm found. Uh, once it was bad uh, and now it's good. I'm glad this season uh, it's more than gifts. Uh, it's more than sitting around uh, and telling stories. It's about recognizing that I was going nowhere and God is now taking me somewhere. He is turning tragedy into triumph. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 reminds us and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. All things, everybody say all things. Even our failures, all things. Even our setbacks, say all things. E even our bad attitudes, all things even mistakes that we've made, all things. You are called, and if you have given your life to Him, He's going to turn all those things and continue as we run to an altar of repentance. Uh, thank you for Christmas, God, because all things, uh, all things um, are going to work together for the good uh, of them that love God. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6 says, Being confident, of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I want to tell somebody tonight that God won't stop working just because you and I have messed up. He can still pick up the pieces that we give him and make something good out of it if we're willing to give him the opportunity. Come on, somebody. That's what Christmas is all about. It's all about him picking up the pieces uh, and making something good about it. But ultimately, you and I hold the key to this. We can wallow in our self-pity. We can live in defeat. We can repent or we can turn it over to God and we can watch him turn our tragedy into a glorious triumph. We hold the key as to whether or not God can use Christmas for what it was designed to be used for in our life. 
If all we do is go through this season and we give and receive and we eat and we sing, if that's all we do, then we have missed the ultimate meaning of Christmas. This Christmas season is the best season to get our life right. This Christmas is the best season to find an altar of repentance uh, and say thank you for being born uh, into this world uh, and giving me an opportunity. This Christmas is the best Christmas to get your life right with God, uh, to get your prayer life back together again, to get your Bible study teaching back together again. God, you can use uh, the tragedies and the failures of my life and you can turn it into the greatest victory that I've ever seen. I need this year for Christmas to be more than me giving and receiving and eating and singing. It needs to be about becoming uh, what God uh, has designed uh, me to become. Uh, I want to understand what Christmas is all about to me. Say amen, guys. You may be seated. We hold the key. Consider another tragedy in the, in the Bible in 2 Samuel chapter 11 in verse number 1 the Bible says and it came to pass after the year was expired that the time when kings were to go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged uh, Rabbath but David tarried at Jerusalem somebody say he stayed behind and it came at pass at evening time that David arose off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon and David sent and inquired after the woman and he said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her and she came unto him and he lay with her for she was purified from her uncleanness and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. We know the story, this, this sin. Oh man, there's so many steps to this sin, isn't there? You know, I mean, when we, when we do something wrong, it's good for us to look back and see the steps that we made to get to that point. It's not like it just happened. Come on, somebody, say amen. It's not like you just had sex with her all of a sudden. And he wants to know, what do you mean you're pregnant? It only was once. He wasn't even supposed to be there. He was supposed to be somewhere else. Let me tell you something, when you're supposed to be somewhere else and you're not where you're supposed to be, it's a good indicator something bad is going to happen. And I wish I was where I was supposed to be. David was not supposed to be at home. He was supposed to be fighting the battle where all kings, the Bible says, were supposed to be. Not only was he not where he was supposed to be, then he got up when he wasn't supposed to get up. It was something that happens when you begin to wander. Wandering leads a person usually to the wrong place. Oh, somebody say amen to that. So first of all, he wasn't even supposed to be in town. Second of all, he was supposed to be fighting and he wasn't fighting. Then he was supposed to be in bed and he was wandering. And he wandered to a place that seemed to be dangerous, on the roof. What was he doing on the roof? The roof. The roof was not on fire. You don't just end up on the roof. You have to be purposeful about it. Now, I understand the way the construction was back then. There's usually a little rooftop terrace, blah, 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 blah. It's not a common place for a king to be on the roof. So we got 
He wasn't supposed to be in Jerusalem. He was supposed to be fighting. He was supposed to be asleep. Now he finds himself on the roof, and now he's looking in the wrong place. There's nobody in here that thinks he didn't know when he was supposed to be up there so he could get a look. I mean, nobody thinks that, right? Somebody's probably, hey, hey. Make sure your servants aren't on the roof at this certain time because they're going to get themselves in trouble. What are you talking about? Well, there's this gal across the way. I've heard she takes a bath around this time. Hmm, filing cabinet. This sin... You understand the progress? And then he's shocked when she's pregnant. This sin led David even further than he intended or even wanted to go. He had to lie. Then eventually he had to commit murder. And David paid dearly for his sin. 2 Samuel eleven twenty seven. 27, the Bible says, When the morning was passed, David sent and fetched her to his house. This is a result of the child having died. She became his wife and bare him a son, another son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. How displeased was God? 2 Samuel chapter 12 Starting verse number 7, the Bible says, And Nathan said unto David that thou art the man when confronted. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives under thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. This is God talking. All you had to do was tell me you didn't have enough. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now if you don't know the story, he found out that she was pregnant, called him back, tried to get him to sleep with his wife. He wouldn't do it because of his loyalty to his king. And so he said, man, I got to get rid of this guy. So he sent him to the front of the lines knowing that he would be killed. And he did die as a result. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hath taken the white wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will rise up evil against thee out of thine own house and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son for thou didst it secretly but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. We don't have time to go into all of the details and the histories of this pronouncement of God on David but in fact all of this happens. The sword never did depart from David's house. There was fighting constantly. And it began to devour immediately. Chapter 12 and verse number 15, the Bible says, And Nathan departed it unto his house. This is the prophet. And then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child. David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of the house arose and went to him to rise him up from the earth. But he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him. And he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? For all the victories, can somebody just agree with me that David had a lot of victories in his life? For all the victories in David's life, 
This blot continues to stain his near perfect record even unto this day. We're preaching about it. But I don't want to spend the next little bit talking just about defeat. We understand it. But I want to show you how God works in spite of the fact that David married Bathsheba and it was based upon adultery, lies, and murder. God in his infinite wisdom was able to even take that tragedy and turn it into a triumph. Because you have to ask yourself, whom did David choose to be king after him? 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 28. Then King David answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. And she came under the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore and said, As the Lord liveth, that he hath redeemed my soul out of all distress. Even as I swear unto thee by the Lord of God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, thy son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. But it was not David who made that choice. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 5 and 6 says, And of all of my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon my son to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. It was not David that chose Solomon. It was God that chose Solomon. The same God who pronounced judgment on David's sin with Bathsheba also chose their offspring to be the king of his people. That's God's gift exchange, if you will. We know that in becoming flesh, God was trying to turn our tragedies into triumphs in giving himself for us. Uh, he began the process of giving gifts uh, at Christmas, uh, not the wise men. It wasn't the wise men who started giving gifts. It was our Lord and Savior who started uh, giving gifts. From the very beginning of time, he was in the process uh, of changing uh, the destination uh, of the soul of every mankind, uh, his ultimate gift uh, of freedom from sin, uh, his ultimate gift uh, of living in eternity with him forever, his ultimate gift, uh, freedom from the chains uh, of temptation uh, and from this world. The Bible says in Mark chapter 8, verse 37, or what? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What can we give God? We cannot give God the ultimate gift like he gave us. God has given us such a wonderful gift of salvation. What in the world can we give him in return? I want to tell you all God wants in return for his gift. He only wants one thing. He wants your life. He wants wants my life. Uh, he wants to turn uh, our tragedies uh, into triumphs. Uh, he wants to be able to take uh, something that's broken uh, and put it back together again. Uh, that's what he wants. Uh, he wants everything uh, about me and everything about you. That's what Christmas is all about. When Jesus stood in the synagogue and read from the scriptures on that that very famous day. He chose to read from Isaiah's prophecy, adding in conclusion that he says when he closed the book, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. As he approached that podium and read from those sacred scrolls in Isaiah 61 and verse number one, he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. 
because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them which are bound. Can somebody say amen to that? To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. I want you to know tonight that as we approach this Christmas season, God is looking for another gift exchange uh, that he's been doing uh, since the first time uh, that mankind broke the covenant between uh, them and God. He is poised and ready. He says, I know exactly how to do this. I know exactly how to give you what you need. I know exactly how to turn uh, your downtime into uptime. I know exactly how to turn your misery into triumph. I know exactly how to turn your miserable ways into joyful praise. He says, if you'll just bring your ashes, I can give you beauty instead of your ashes. If you'll just bring your mourning to me, I can give you joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. If you'll bring your heaviness to me, I'll give you praise if you bring your tragedy to me I can give you triumph in your life this ladies and gentlemen is the true meaning of Christmas it's the exchange between the evil for the good it's the exchange between sin and salvation it's the exchange between going the wrong way and starting to go the right way somebody get on your feet and give God praise tonight God uh, wants to let somebody know uh, that your time is not over. Your day is not coming to an end, uh, but the season uh, is just beginning in your life. Uh, God wants to take somebody's tragedy uh, and he wants to turn it uh, into a triumph. Come on, somebody. He wants to bind up the brokenhearted. Uh, he wants to proclaim liberty to somebody. This is Christmas. Uh, this is what Christmas uh, is all about. Uh, it started in the Garden of Eden. Uh, oh, where are you? Oh, Adam, where are you? He's looking uh, for somebody. He's been looking for somebody to give a gift to from the very beginning uh, of time. Uh, and until the trumpet sounds, uh, he's going to still be looking for somebody to give a Christmas uh, gift uh, to. Uh, oh, uh, what have you done? Uh, let me turn it around for you. Where have you been? Uh, let me turn it around for you. What have you done? Uh, I can take it. I can make it right again. Uh, come unto me, all ye that are heavy uh, and laden, uh, and I can give you rest. Uh, the great uh, gift exchange. Come on, he wants to plant somebody. He wants to make you a tree of righteousness uh, that he might be glorified in your life. This is what we've come to experience. This is what we've come to love. And we have Christmas every single day of our life. We don't have to wait till December 25th uh, to have a gift exchange uh, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The true meaning of Christmas uh, is not about waiting. It's about taking the opportunity right when we need it right now. Hallelujah. It's about making sure that God uh, is in our lives uh, and exchanging uh, the bad for the good. Come on, let's lift our hands and thank the Lord in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, yes, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, the devil's not ready for somebody to get lined up in the Christmas line with Jesus Christ. 
The devil's not happy if somebody goes into the gift exchange line with Jesus Christ. God, take what I have. Oh, he don't want it. Yes, he does want him. He's not interested in what I've done. Yes, he is interested in it. He's always been interested in it. When he was God uh, in the heavens, he was interested in it. And when he robed himself in flesh, uh, he was interested in it. Uh, and when he ascended into heaven, uh, he was interested in it. He wants what we have. He wants what we've become. He wants our problems, uh, our difficulties, uh, our tragedies. Uh, he wants them because he is the ultimate gift exchanger. Oh, yes, God. Come on, the true meaning of Christmas uh, is that I was going one way, but God entered into my life uh, and turned me around, uh, and now I'm going a brand new. That's Christmas, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, the meaning of Christmas is once I was lost, uh, but now I'm found. Once I was blind, uh, but now I see. Uh, once I was going nowhere, but now I'm going somewhere. I didn't have a name, uh, but now I've got his name. This is Christmas. Uh, I was down and out, but when I met Jesus Christ, uh, he brought me up, uh, and I'm going somewhere now. Come on, are you glad for Christmas in your life? Come on, has God done something for you in your life uh, that you can say, thank you, Jesus. Uh, thank you, Lord God. Oh, yes, God. Oh, thank you, Lord, for taking my mess and turning it around and making something awesome. Hallelujah. Remain standing. Eve didn't understand what was happening. When, G, when God looked at her and looked through her through time and said, you may have messed up, but as a result of your mess up, I'm going to make a triumph. And through you, through you is going to come a man that's going to defeat this enemy. David and Bathsheba probably thought their time was over, that God was going to move on to a different line. But it was through their mess up that God said, I'm going to choose Solomon from your loins. The wisest man that ever lived. Why? Because he said of God, I just want you. I don't want riches. I don't want fame. I just want you. I just want you. What would be the difference in years to come and even in this very moment right now that would start the change of direction for the future of so much of mankind if someone would say, we were naked, we were scared, and we were hiding from you, God. And start that process of coming back to Him. What would happen in someone's life if when confronted either by our own conscience or by God Himself, the preached word would say, it's me, it's me that you talk. I stole the sheep. It's me, as David said and fall to his feet and repent. God can only make a difference if one is willing to join him for Christmas season. He can only make a difference if someone shows up. He can't make a difference. If we're indifferent, we say, so what, who cares? I've gone so far if we believe the lie of Satan that says, I've done so much, God could never help me. I've gone so far that God could never restore me. That's a lie from Satan. The true meaning of Christmas that is not just re relegated to this season, but celebrated, is that for all of time, God has been interested in exchanging with humanity. He's been interested in taking our 
mess and turning it to being blessed in our life. Let's lift our hands one more time to heaven and thank the Lord for his goodness in our life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness in our life, God. Thank you, Lord God, that, Lord Jesus, the ultimate meaning for Christmas is that exchange that you started long ago. It's not something new. But, God, you're a pro at it. You're good at it, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that opportunity, God, to come before you have that ultimate exchange in my life, God. I ask God that you touch each and every one of us. Help us, Lord Jesus. I ask, Lord God, that you would help us to seek you in spite of our difficulties and challenges. Why don't you grab the hand of the person next to you and why don't we pray one for another before we're dismissed tonight. And let's pray that God would give each of us the desire that if there are exchanges that need to be made in our life that we would make them if there are attitudes in our life that we would exchange them if we're not at peace in our life that we would come before the Lord and ask God to help us work it out if there's sin in our life that we would ask for forgiveness and God would turn that tragedy into a triumph in our life if we're headed in the wrong direction that God would help us to make a U-turn and that we would change directions and follow after him we pray right now for our brother and our sister we pray right now lord god that each and every one of us would recognize the true meaning of christmas is really about what you want to do for us god it's really about you providing to us lord jesus i thank you lord god i pray lord jesus touch touch us lord jesus Touch each and every one of us, Lord God. Touch us, Lord Jesus. Touch us. Help us, Lord God. Help us, help us, help us, help us, God. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. I give myself away. Lord Jesus, help me to give it away, God. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I turn it over to you, Lord Jesus. I give myself away so you opportunity to come before the Lord. God wants to do an exchange with somebody tonight. Come on with our hands lifted up and say, Lord Jesus, there needs to be some talking to the Lord here tonight. We need to be asking God to forgive us. We need to be asking God about a direction. We need to be asking God, Lord Jesus, exchange this in my life, God. Be the ultimate Christmas time right now. The ultimate meaning for Christmas, God. I need you to turn this tragedy, God, into triumph in my life, Lord Jesus. God, we need to turn this around in our lives, Lord God. 
and allow something great to begin to happen, Lord Jesus, in our own life, God. Hallelujah, Jesus, 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 Jesus. My life is not God, yes, God, yes, God. Turn it around in our life, God. Turn it around, God, in our life. Help me to recognize my hope is in you. My hope is in you, God. My hope is in you, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. My hope is in you, Jesus. My hope is in you, God. My hope is in you. God, yes, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, God forgive us, Lord Jesus. We come before you, God. We come before you, Jesus. We come before you, God. We come before you, Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. God, turn it around in our life, God. Turn it around, God, in our life. Turn it around, God. Turn it around, Jesus. Turn it around, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, yes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. wants to do a special work in our lives. For some of us, it's a process. For some of us, it's stepping stones. We have to allow the God process to work in our life. It's the perfect process. Say it's the perfect process. It is the perfect process for God to work on us and change us. But there is nothing that God won't get involved in. There's nothing that God will not get involved in. He will get involved in anything if we invite him into it. There is not a distance that we could go, a depth that we could reach, that God will not extend himself to. That is the true meaning of Christmas that God is willing to go as far as it takes and do what it takes to take us and make us into a tree of life that he might be glorified. Amen? Let's give the Lord a praise of thanksgiving. A thanksgiving. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck and say, I'm glad for Christmas. I'm glad for the Christmas season. Sunday morning, Sunday morning church, 10 o'clock, 9.30 in the prayer hall. Hallelujah. God bless you.